Hello, love bugs. This is Nick. And this is Andy. And we host The Concession Stand, a podcast from two guys who work in the TV and movie business right here in Los Angeles. And you're listening to the Dirty Bits Podcast on the Orbital Jigsaw Network. Hi, I'm Tawny Plattis, and you're listening to Dirty Bits, the show where a voiceover artist very casually, and sometimes comedically, retells the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories your history teacher probably left out. If you're a love bug, as we call our listeners, or a dirty birdie, as we call our Patreon supporters, stay tuned after the episode for listener shoutouts, special insider info, and podcast recommendations from the Dirty Bits newsroom you won't want to miss. Enjoy the show. Fidel Castro. His first name is derived from the Latin word meaning faithful, which is pretty ironic when you're accused of sleeping with 35,000 women over the course of your life. One of the most controversial figures of the 20th and 21st centuries, Castro was the prime minister of Cuba from 1959 to 1976, and was the president from 1976 to 2008, making him the longest-serving non-royal head of state in both centuries. He was a Cuban revolutionary, a politician, a vocal supporter of socialism, and an opponent of imperialism. It was under Castro's administration that Cuba became a one-party communist state, which resulted in sweeping socialist reforms like businesses being nationalized. And those who supported Castro saw him as a leader who helped advance social and economic justice, as well as obtaining independence from U.S. imperialism. His critics view him as a dictator responsible for the mass migration of Cubans from the country, tanking the economy, and engaging in human rights violations. Fidel Castro was the son of a wealthy Spanish sugar farmer Ángel Castro y Arguiz. Ángel's first marriage didn't work out, so he conveniently found a servant from his household staff to be his mistress, and eventually his wife, a Canarian woman named Lina Ruz González. Including Fidel, they had seven children. Castro says, It was my own father who gave me my first cigar, back in Biran. I must have been 14 or 15. I smoked that first puro and I didn't know how it was done. Fortunately, I didn't inhale the smoke. Although you always absorb a little bit of the nicotine, even if you don't inhale at all. When he was six, Fidel went to live with his teacher. At eight years old, he was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, which meant he could attend this boarding school where he would misbehave so terribly that he was sent to a private school in Santiago. And after that, he went to the University of Havana, where he studied law. In Havana, he met some other people in college and was like, I don't know anything about politics, you guys. Can you teach me about this protesting activism stuff? I love your passion. I love how anti-imperialism you all are. I too think the US should stay the hell out of the Caribbean. And you're so right. President Grau is hella corrupt. This is really cool. And they were like, you're really fired up and quite dashing. Welcome to the team. Fidel then ran for president of the Federation of University Students, promising honesty, decency, and justice. The students looked at each other like, who's this Fidel Castro guy? Oh, he's that annoying social justice warrior kid. Hank said he'll give us pizza on Fridays if he's president. I'm voting for Hank. And Castro lost to Hank because who can compete with pizza? (laughs) But much like Tina Fey, J.K. Rowling, and Alan Rickman, who also had tough starts to their careers, Fidel never gave up. In 1947, Castro heard about this plan to overthrow Rafael Trujillo's Dominican right-wing government that was really chummy with the U.S. And Fidel goes, I'm so in. Let's grab some snacks, fill up the tank, road trip. But America finds out about their little spring break plans. So President Truman calls Cuba and goes, hey, get control of your guy there, pal. And Cuba goes, oh yeah, for sure. Don't even worry about it. We got you, fam. God, college kids, so extra nowadays, right? 
and President Gro of Cuba stops the invasion, with Castro and several of his friends avoiding arrest, fortunately for them. The following year, Castro was looking to start some shit again, so he goes to Colombia with the student group. While he's there, the well-liked leftist leader, Jorge Alicier Gaitan Ayala, is assassinated, which led to rioting and chaotic buffoonery. So Fidel goes, aw yeah, gets super involved, and starts stealing guns from police stations to help out. When he got bored with all of that, he returned to Cuba to continue his work, becoming a well-known figure in his quest to prevent the government from raising bus fares. That's when he would meet Mirta diaz Belar, a student from a wealthy, elite family. While Castro's father had been wealthy, he was apparently an uncultured swine in his son's eyes. Despite the disapproval of both families, the two were married, though Mirta's dad did give them tens of thousands of dollars to make sure they could enjoy their three-month honeymoon in New York City properly. Fidel was a simple man. In 1949, Mirta gave birth to Fidelito, their first child together, and Castro thought it was best to mellow out and just focus on leisurely activities, like graduating as a doctor of law by next fall. After graduation, Castro became co-founder of a legal partnership that focused on serving Cubans in poverty, which crashed and burned financially. Fidel didn't seem to understand how money worked, or was simply out of shits to give. He didn't pay his bills, everything he owned was repossessed, and then the electricity was turned off, which didn't stress his wife out in the slightest. Castro ran for Congress in 1952, but his colleagues were like, if we're being 100% honest, we really don't know how you're going to go over. You have a reputation. You act like everyone isn't seeing all of your radical Instagram stories. Oh yeah, we follow you on all your social media accounts, Fidel. Don't think you're hiding anything from us. We can't nominate you, sorry. Not sorry. But party members in Havana's poorest districts all went, you know, I really like what this Fidel dude is saying. I'm totes going to nominate him. At the time, Prio is president, and is bananas corrupt. So General Fulgencio Batista, the former president who had returned to politics with the Unitary Action Party, shows up with his squad and stages a coup. Prio dips to Mexico, and Batista goes, <laughs> I'll take it from here, y'all. No need for elections, I'm going to start a disciplined democracy. Trust me, it's, it's gonna be good. But Castro and gang is like, that's called a dictatorship, you repulsive monkey fudge nugget. We are about to slap you over the head so hard with litigation, you won't be able to see the people you're oppressing. But when all of the lawyering didn't really accomplish anything, Castro was like, you know, I was speaking metaphorically about slapping him over the head, but what if we actually slapped him over the head? And his friends go, you want to slap the president over the head? And Castro's like, kind of. Like, what if we overthrow him? Let's launch an attack on the Moncada barracks. And everyone's like, yeah, overthrow the government. But the attack fails miserably, and Castro is imprisoned. While he's doing time, he starts reading Marx, Lenin, Freud, Kant, and Shakespeare, just to name a few. At first, the guards were like, you're a handsome, charismatic kid. We like you. Just keep being cool, and we'll let you pretty much do whatever you want. That lasts all of four nanoseconds before he's tossed into solitary after he leads the other inmates in singing anti-President Batista songs when the guy comes to visit in 1954. While all of this is going on, Castro hears a radio announcement one day saying his wife, Mirta, is working for the Ministry of the Interior, which is positively appalling. He says he would have preferred to die a thousand times rather than suffer impotently from such an insult. They begin the divorce process, and Mirta takes custody of Fidelito. Castro was released from prison in May of 1955, after having served one year. He goes to Mexico with his brother Raul, and they meet a Marxist-Leninist Argentine doctor named Ernest Guevara. He shakes their hands like, hey, hey, how are ya? Oh, you can call me Che. 
Dr. Che. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. It's, it's Che. Just Che. Che was working as a journalist and a photographer for Argencia Latina de Noticias. Castro liked him and said he was a more advanced revolutionary than I was. They formed a revolutionary group called the 26th of July Movement and went back to Cuba where they led a guerrilla war against President Batista. The U.S. government then stopped supplying the Cuban administration with weaponry due to all the anti-Batista feels among the citizens. Castro assumed military and political power as Cuba's prime minister in 1959, after finally launching a successful revolution. Fidel then went to the U.S. to introduce himself to everyone. He brought a plate of cookies, and he goes, Hi everyone, I'm Fidel Castro. I'm running the show in Cuba now. I love baseball. I'm a total night owl. Ernest Hemingway's biggest fan. And I'm really excited to see where this next step in my career is going to take me. Let's see. Oh, I've also appointed myself as president of the national tourist industry. I'd love to get more African Americans to come by and say hi. We're super not down with the whole racism thing like the US. Oh my gosh, you guys would love it here. Also, I hate Nixon. Nixon sucks. Anyway, I'm reducing the salary of judges and politicians and giving the lower level civil servants a raise. And everyone who pays $100 or less in rent a month I'm cutting that shit in half. You guys, Cuba is going to rock. And people ask him, so your government is socialist. Are you a communist? You're appointing Marxists to senior government and military positions. Che fucking Guevara is governor of the Central Bank and Minister of Industries. You're kind of looking like a commie right now, Fidel. And Fidel looks at these journalists dead in the eye and goes, I? I am not a communist. To which, naturally, everyone responds with a resounding, yeah, okay. Fidel Castro put a large emphasis on social projects to improve the standard of living in Cuba. He opened more classrooms in 30 months than had been opened in 30 years. The primary education system had a work-study program where students spent 50% of their time in the classroom and 50% of their time in what was called a productive activity. Healthcare was expanded as well as nationalized. Infant mortality rates plummeted. Dramatic improvements to infrastructure were implemented, and within the first six months of Castro's administration, 600 miles of roads were constructed, and $300 million was spent to improve water and sanitation. Over 800 houses were built every month to reduce homelessness. Daycares as well as centers for the disabled and elderly were opened which is all super cool, right? But his same little peccadillo of either not understanding or caring how economics worked kind of got in the way. The economy tanked, and the middle class, doctors, and engineers all left for Florida in what was called a brain drain. Productivity took a nosedive, and within two years, the country was MC Hammer broke. Cuban exiles, the CIA, and Dominican government began funding militant anti-Castro groups that led to the six-year Escambre Rebellion. Castro would order the arrest of hundreds of counter-revolutionaries and had them thrown in solitary confinement in addition to being roughed up. Castro wasn't a fan of the U.S. and sided with the Soviets during the Cold War. Things got really intense and Castro was getting nervous about the U.S. backing a coup, so he doubled the size of Cuba's armed forces. Then the Bay of Pigs happened, and Castro said, publicly, mind you, what the imperialists cannot forgive us is that we have made a socialist revolution under their noses, which meant he had finally admitted to being a socialist. He then formed an alliance with the Soviet Union and began the Cuban Missile Crisis, saying, you guys can put your nukes at my house, no biggie, just let me clean out my garage real quick. In the 90s, Castro was super into environmentalism and was vehemently against globalization. By 2006, he was like, I'm really not feeling great as I'm getting older. I'm going to give all my work to my brother Raul, the vice president. He's quoted as telling the Communist Party, I'll be 90 years old soon. Soon, I'll be like all the others. The time will come for all of us. 
but the ideas of the Cuban communists will remain as proof on this planet that if they are worked at with fervor and dignity, they can produce the material and cultural goods that human beings need, and we need to fight without truce to obtain them. Castro died in November 2016 of what was described as natural causes. The media and government in South Florida had anticipated absolute chaos, with Miami planning to throw a big ol' shindig in the Orange Bowl Stadium. Schools were supposed to get out early, and officials planned on blocking the piers to prevent an anticipated mass amount of Cuban refugees from entering the state. But when Raul became the leader, things got way more chill, and all the chaos didn't end up hitting Florida as anticipated. There had already been reports of scandalous and salacious secrets about Castro before he passed away. But as he grew older, the stories that began circulating through the media got real fun. Fidel was super hot when he was young, kind of channeling the whole rugged Jon Snow look. He was also a rebellious bad boy, which as many of us know, can be incredibly alluring. Women would actually swoon in his presence. Swoon. In 2008, the New York Post published an article that claimed a former, unnamed official said that Fidel Castro had slept with 35,000 women. The deets were so juicy, love bug. The tattletale said that Castro took women with his meals like they were condiments. He'd shag at least two women a day, usually at lunch and dinner, but occasionally at breakfast, if he was feeling peckish. <laughs> His guards supposedly combed the beaches for women they thought Fidel would like, and Vanity Fair reported that same year that he was a shameless flirt who would pepper his speeches with vulgar sexual innuendos. He was allegedly a notorious Don Juan, a Casanova, a Lothario, a five foot four sex pot. His reputation as a lusty and energetic bedmate preceded him, and many of his people referred to him as El Caballo, the horse beginning in the 1960s. But information about Castro's family and private life have historically been rare to uncover because of the heavy censorship implemented by the country's media. In 2010, The Telegraph reported that discussing Fidel's womanizing ways is strictly taboo on the Caribbean communist outpost. Then in July 2016, just months before Castro died, his former bodyguard who had split to the States writes this tell-all, The Double Life of Fidel Castro, My 17 Years as Personal Bodyguard to El Leader Maximo. And then it just all came out. As we know, Fidel had been married to Mirta diaz Balar in 1949, and they had a son, Fidelito, together. When Fidelito grew up, he was actually fired from his job at Cuba's nuclear power program by his very own father. Castro said he was fired for incompetence. We don't have a monarchy here. After his divorce from Mirta, Fidel went on to have a child, Jorge Angel, with Maria Labarde. He had a previously unreported child, Panchita Pupo, with an unknown woman. Then he had a daughter, Alina Fernandez, with the famous aristocratic bombshell, Natalia Ruvelta. He had a son named Ciro in the early 1960s who came from another hit it and quit it kind of a night. Then another son supposedly came along in 1970. If you've lost count, that's six women and six children. Even back in 1993, when journalist Anne Louise Bardock asked Castro how many children he had, he said something to the effect of, it's for sure less than 12. It's not like I have a tribe or anything. <laughs> it's, it's less than 12. It has to be less than 12. Which isn't surprising because Sanchez claimed Castro cheated like a hungover kid taking a pop quiz in AP Calculus. Castro's former bodyguard wrote that he had actually slept with his comrade Celia Sanchez, his private secretary, confidant, and guard dog for 30 or so years. He's also said to have had a romp with his French interpreter, his English interpreter, and a Cuban airline attendant who would accompany him on his foreign jaunts. He doubtless had other relationships that I did not know about, said Sanchez. He seemed to prefer blondes. Ugh, of course Marilyn Monroe was right. And he is reported to have seduced a fleece of Italian, German, and American women in the 1950s and into the 1960s. In fact, 
In 1959, Fidel had an affair with Marita Lorenz, a 19-year-old, beautiful German non-blonde who had been hired by the CIA to assassinate him, no biggie. Marita was transfixed by Castro, saying, when Fidel talks to you, he talks to you very close. He looks right in your eye. Nothing hit me as hard as this as ever, like a ton of bricks. He didn't let me completely undress. He was the sweetest, tenderest. I guess nobody ever forgets their first lover. Which I can imagine would be the case when you're hired to murder someone and then chicken out. She flushed the poisonous pills she was supposed to slip him and spent the rest of her time in Cuba making whoopee with Fidel Castro in the Havana Hilton. Anne Louise Bardock went on to write a book entitled Without Fidel. She gave an interview to two journalists from Vice detailing what she found during her research. Anne told the journalists, like most Cuban men, Castro viewed having sex as an entitlement. Sex, after all, is Cuba's national sport he had affairs or slept with all kinds of women. He even had a son with one of his minister's wives, or so it was commonly believed. They would used to say that it was pretty shameless. Some of these women thought that they were the one true love. I even know one who dodged his handler charged with managing his conquests. No one knows how many women he slept with, probably not even him. I understood I could never begin to explain to him the why and the how of the Monica Lewinsky-Clinton scandal. He was truly baffled as to why having too many girlfriends could be a political liability. I think for him, being a womanizer, as a Latin man, was connected to political power. Originally, his political power came from his first marriage to Mirta diaz Balar, mother of his eldest son, whose family was politically powerful whereas Fidel's father just had money, but zero culture. Fidel did not remarry again until after his second wife, Dahlia, had given him five grown sons, which was exactly the MO of his father, who did not marry Fidel's mother until long after she had six children with him, not to mention the son he had with the woman who worked on their estate. A friend of mine had an affair with Fidel when she was 15 or 16 and said she recalled being on the balcony of his room on the 23rd floor of the Habana Libra Hotel. Fidel said to her, one day soon, every Cuban will have a car of their own. Kind of funny as most are lucky to even have a bicycle. The vice journalist also had a friend who said, everybody in Miami has a cousin, which meant an illegitimate child of Fidel Castro's. In the 1960s, Castro met Dalia Soto del Vell, a blonde, green-eyed former school teacher while on a literacy campaign. Sanchez, the former bodyguard who degaffed hard after leaving Cuba, wrote, Fidel spotted in the first row a gorgeous girl with whom he rapidly started exchanging furative and meaningful glances. They were a couple for decades and may have secretly married in 1980. But Dahlia was largely kept from the public eye. She was almost never seen in public and was never seen by her husband's side. In fact, Castro's personal life was so off limits that his wife wasn't even seen on television until 2003. In Castro's pursuit of getting his own TV show alongside the Duggars, he fathered five children with Dahlia. Alexis, Alex, Alejandro, Antonio, and Angelito. Those first three A's were named for Alexander the Great, who was admired by Castro. The Five A's, which would have been a great name for a boy band, didn't grow up being exposed to the power that their father had. They never received military training and didn't partake in any of the international aid missions that Fidel imposed on every other young Cuban. Today, most of Castro's children still live on the family property, Punto Cero, which kind of stands in stark contrast to the type of living Castro advocated for. But Castro was adamant that he practiced what he preached, claiming, I live in a fucking fisherman's hut on the beach. I make 900 pesos a month. That's 43 American Benjamins to you capitalist bourgeois pigs. But Forbes was having none of that bullshit and regularly listed Fidel as one of the richest rulers in the world. He was reported to have owned and controlled multiple businesses in Havana and was worth $500 million, all the while saying, I don't have a cent of my own. But Sanchez says, while his people suffered, 
Fidel Castro lived in comfort, keeping everything, including his eight children, his many mistresses, even his wife, a secret. Fidel had 20 souped up luxury properties and his own island that he sailed to on a yacht that was adorned exclusively with exotic wood imported from Angola. With its orange, lemon, mandarin, grapefruit, and banana trees, the estate resembled a Garden of Eden, especially if one compared it with the notorious ration book that all the Cubans had to use to buy food. He goes on to say that every member of the A-Team, as we're now calling all the Alex's Castro fathered, owned their own cow. So as to satisfy each one's individual taste, since the acidity and creaminess of fresh milk varies from one cow to another. In 1992, Castro said, private life, in my opinion, should not be an instrument for publicity or politics. Fortunately, the Dirty Bits podcast is an entertainment show. And as one of my favorite podcasters, Scott Thrower of Fairy Tales for Unwanted Children says, you can be embarrassed or dead, but you can't be both. Thanks for listening. As always, we love our community of listeners and appreciate any comments, corrections, suggestions, or ideas you have for us. Feel free to contact us by sending an email to tawny at tawnyvoice.com or just hitting us up on social media. See you next Tuesday. The following may make your head pop unless you're a Dirty Bits podcast fan that can differentiate between a love bug and a dirty birdie. Listener discretion advised. Welcome to the Dirty Bits newsroom, the after show that updates our hardcore fans that we love the most on all the fun and exciting upcoming features on the show. George and I will be in LA October 13th to the 22nd. If any of you will be in the area, let us know. We'd love to meet up to have coffee, dinner, or whatever it is you're partial to. Shoot us a message and let's chat. The Dirty Bits has also joined the Orbital Jigsaw Network. We're proud to be a part of a wonderful pod family and have some brothers and sisters on the network we think you'd positively adore. Visit orbitaljigsaw.com, where you can discover high-quality, entertaining shows as well as our positively adorbs merchandise. We love talking with our super fans, like Michelle G., who's all the way in Australia and has been leaving us in stitches in our Facebook group. Hey girl, thanks for bringing so much sunshine to our day. We'd be positively overjoyed if you let us know how we're doing by leaving us a review on Facebook, iTunes, or just sending us a message. Like these positively adorbs reviews from our buddies Todd H. and Mig Camp on iTunes. Todd says, Funny and informative. Very good storytelling as well as a good sense of humor. The stories are interesting and wild. Definitely a great listen. And Mig Camp says, love the concept and the storytelling of this. If you're a history buff like I am and love backstories and little known facts about some of history's biggest characters, you'll love this show. Love the delivery and the production of the whole thing. Great work. Many of you have requested longer, bigger, more frequent episodes. We would absolutely love to produce the show for you full-time and bring you animation, merchandise, live shows, tours, and anything your dirty little heart requests. If that's something you would like to see, you can help us work towards making that a reality by visiting us at patreon.com slash dirtybits and becoming an official Dirty Birdie. When you become an official Dirty Birdie, you can enjoy early episodes, free swag, behind-the-scenes video, live and recorded rehearsals, the ability to pick our next episode, Patreon-only episodes, and so much more. Every one of your contributions to the show means so much, especially to those who aren't able to donate. George and I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Some of you have contacted me regarding my day job as a voiceover, business, and marketing coach. If you're looking to sustainably grow your business, contact me for a special discounted coaching rate just for you. Thank you for listening to these important updates from the Dirty Bits newsroom, love bugs, and dirty birdies.